Uh, today, I'm not going to be speaking on uh, the first 28 verses of Matthew 24. I gave that uh, reference uh, because it encapsulates four different uh, statements by Jesus Christ regarding deception. And that is going to be our focus today. It's going to be a thematic message uh, taken from Matthew 24, but also looking at uh, a number of other passages, mainly in the New Testament. Some of you have heard Jacob Prash and others emphasize that in the Olivet Discourse, in that extended teaching where Jesus answered the question of the disciples regarding the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the sign of his coming, as well as the end of the age, that, that Jesus warned about deception four times as much as any other single thing. Four different times Jesus mentions deception in Matthew chapter 24. The first time, it's a command. And so, in the introduction, I'm emphasizing the last half of Matthew 24 and verse 4 as one of the commands of Christ. See to it that no one misleads you. Instead of launching into a detailed explanation and answer for the various questions which the disciples, disciples asked on that day, he leads off with something that I'm quite sure they were not expecting. See to it that no one misleads you. This is the next to the last message in the series on the commands of Christ. In two weeks, we'll conclude our series when we look at the last half of Matthew 24 and the principle of spiritual readiness. Spiritual readiness in the last days. But today, we're dealing with the topic of deception in the last days. Now, the word that's translated mislead in Matthew 24 is the Greek verb planao. It's used four times. It's used in Matthew 24. It's, it's used in verse 4, verse 5, verse 11, and verse 24. And we'll look at all four of those instances in some detail today. This word is used 39 times total in the New Testament. It means to lead away from the truth, to lead into error, to deceive. Jesus is warning about deception in Matthew 24. And in particular, with regard to the last days leading up to his second coming. And he initially issues it in the form of a command. See to it that no one misleads you. Now, of those 39 times this word is used in the New Testament, four other times it's in command. Do not be deceived. Three in the writings of Paul, once it's utilized by James. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Do not be deceived, for various classifications of people, including fornicators and thieves and homosexuals, will not inherit the kingdom of God, if they don't repent of their sin and believe in the gospel. Do not be deceived. I think we're all painfully aware of the last day's deception of the enemy to teach a false gospel, to teach easy believism, to teach belief in Jesus Christ without repentance from sin. And we know that that is quite prevalent in this day. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, in the chapter dealing with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Paul 
in a, in a few short verses takes time to give instruction about the moral implications of the resurrection. Do not be deceived, he says in 1 Corinthians 15.33. Bad company corrupts good morals. But what do we find in, in many evangelical circles today? It doesn't matter how you live. You can engage in the same practices as unbelievers in an effort and an attempt to bridge to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. God does not want us to participate in the deeds of unrighteousness. The Bible makes that clear. Now, the Bible does want us to take the gospel to those who don't yet believe. The Bible wants us to develop and cultivate personal relationships with people who have not yet repented of their sin, who have not yet believed in the gospel, in order to gain an opportunity to share that truth with them. But we don't do so on the basis of engaging in sinful behavior and communicating that in some way that is acceptable to God. It's not. Bad company corrupts good morals. Don't be deceived. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, Paul writes, Do not be deceived. May pranastha. May pranastha in the Greek. It's a command. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. What is the modern day deception that embraces that description and that warning? It's, it's the deception by Satan to the world. And to an unbelieving apostate church that there aren't consequences to sin. It doesn't matter how you live. What matters is, is what you feel. What matters is what you experience. After all, God is a God of love. God is a God of forgiveness. And there are no consequences to your actions. That is a lie and a deception from the enemy. James 1.16 reads something like this. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. The three verses preceding verse 16 talk about how temptation <coughs> can lead to sin which ultimately leads to death. Satan is deceiving people today about all three of those things. And then the verses immediately following verse 16 talk about the fact that every good and perfect gift comes from God. And God has provided for us the means of salvation, the means of forgiveness from our sin so that we might be a picture of first fruits. And again, Satan is lying about the gospel. Satan is deceiving the world about how to get saved. Satan is deceiving the world about God and the fact that he is a good God and a giver of every good and perfect gift that comes from above. <coughs> See to it that no one misleads you. Now, that leads me to the second occurrence of the word mislead or deceive, and it's found in verse 5. Matthew 25 and verse 5. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. How many will come in Christ's name? 
Many. And how many will they mislead? Many. Many will come and will mislead many. And while it doesn't use the word pseudo-Christos in the text, it describes pseudo-Christos. It describes false Christ. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. He's talking about false Christ. He's warning about false messiahs. In the days leading up to my return, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. The warning is concerning many false Christs. Now, when we think of false Christ and false messiahs, one of the terms that immediately comes to mind is the word antichrist. Now, we've, we've taught on a number of, of, of occasions that this is, is not a translation. This is a transliteration. It is the Greek word antichristos. Christos is transliterated into the English word Christ. It literally means the anointed one. The anointed one. But it's transliterated from the Greek as a title. And the, the Greek preposition anti does not primarily mean against, although the Bible certainly communicates and declares that the Antichrist is against Christ. It means in place of or instead of. It's a counterfeit Christ. It's a false Christ. The Antichrist, when he comes, will come and deceive those who dwell upon the earth. Those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ will actually believe that he is God in human flesh. Now, you might find it interesting to learn, if you don't know this already, that the word Antichrist only occurs in the writings of John the Apostle. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And I'll read for you verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour. So even in John's day, as he wrote this book, near the end of the first century, A.D., he declares that that many antichrists have, have already come into the world. But he also refers to a coming antichrist. A coming world leader. A coming world ruler. Who has many titles in the Bible. Son of destruction. Man of lawlessness. Man of sin. The beast. Here, he's called the in place of Christ. Verse 22, John writes, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Satan wants to deny the truth about Jesus Christ. Because that is how God has provided for salvation for sinners. Satan is deceiving the world. Every false religion, every cult that ex exists on this planet shares two things in common. They deny that Jesus is the Christ that he is the God-man. They deny that he is God in human flesh. 
and they deny the substitutionary atonement, and they teach, they claim, they affirm falsely, they lie, and declare that man is capable of working his own way into heaven through his own efforts and good works. That is the spirit of Antichrist and the epitome of deception. Listen to what John says in chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading in verse 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. So there's a spirit of Antichrist. Theologians sometimes refer to this by the German term Zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. And what is the spirit of the age? The spirit of the age is do what you want. Do what feels good. There are no moral absolutes. Spirit of the age. And that spirit will someday be embodied in a single person on this planet. Finally, in 2 John, in verse 7, we read these words. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. It's all about deception. It's all about lies. It's all about Satan's effort. To get people to question God's word, God's character, God's provision, God's love, God's answer to their problem. Now this leads me to the third use. of our featured word this morning, found in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 11, where we, we read, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Now, this one we, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to, you know, look at the language itself and figure out what Jesus is saying. He's saying, many false prophets, that's what's in view. What was in view in verse 5? Anybody remember? False Many false Christs. What's in view in verse 11? Many false prophets. Many false prophets. There have been false prophets on this planet for a long, long time. Jeremiah and Ezekiel stood up against the false prophets of their day. Jesus Christ spoke against the false prophets of his day. He predicted that many false prophets would arise and mislead many. Now, who's, who's going to be the ultimate false prophet? The one identified in the book of Revelation as the false prophet, correct? The one who actually assists and enables and helps Antichrist to be the center of a global religion.
religion which declares him to be God in the flesh. And everyone whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life will fall down and worship him as God. Now, before that happens, Jesus says, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. There are so many examples that I could come up with. So many examples of false prophets in our day, in our time. Let me just give you a, a couple of examples. There was a man who primarily lived in the 20th century and a few years in this century, who had a great impact upon the church in the West, and in particular, the evangelical church in the West. And this man had a great impact even though he acknowledged publicly, even though he was on record as declaring that he was not a born-again Christian. This man's name was Peter Drucker. And he was held in high esteem as the foremost marketing guru on planet Earth. He wanted to change the world. And he is the one who initially came up with the concept of the three-legged stool. Changing the world through government, through the financial system, and through what he called nonprofits, we would call the church. Through government, through economics, and through religion. Wow. Reminiscent of the book of Revelation, is it not? There's going to be a one world government someday, right? There's going to be a one world economic system someday, right? There's going to be a one world religion someday. Peter Drucker is the one who made that popular on a secular level. But he also made inroads into the evangelical church because he recognized that the best and most effective way to bring about change was through this phenomenon in the West that we call the megachurch. So he took under his wing Rick Warren, Bill Hybels, and another man who's not as well known, named Bob Buford, who's the head of Leadership Network, who's the head of, of the publishing operation of Evangelical Christianity, the marketing operation of Evangelical Christianity. And those three individuals have done more to change and influence the evangelical church in the West than anybody else that I'm aware of in the last 25 years. All three of these men practice some form of contemplative spirituality. All three of these men are directly involved in the emergent movement. All three of these men <coughs> promote spiritual formation and mysticism. Now, <coughs> by far, in terms of name recognition, the most famous is Rick Warren. And he's come up with many things, including the Daniel Plan, in recent years, as well as something that he called last decade 
his global peace plan. Remember that? And it was an acronym for five different things. Two E's in peace, neither one of which stand for evangelism. He couldn't have evangelism as part of his global peace plan because he wanted to partner with other religions in order to have greater access and greater influence from a human point of view. And so he partners with Hindus and Muslims in order to affect global peace. Now, when it comes to peace, I'm going to go on record today and I'm going to call Rick Warren a false prophet. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. After concluding chapter 4 with the well-known instruction concerning the rapture and the, and the resurrection of the church, Paul writes these words beginning in verse 1. Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Anybody who is talking about global peace, apart from the person of Jesus Christ in the last days, is a false prophet. The Bible tells us there will not be global peace until the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. And it's reminiscent of the words of Jeremiah 6.14 when there were false prophets in Jeremiah's day. God was declaring that war and judgment was coming. And those false prophets, they had a different message. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. There will never be peace apart from the Prince of Peace. Whether on a global or on an individual level. Another example. Excuse me. Another example. concerns a man that is not quite as familiar as Rick Warren. We have mentioned him here at FBC. He's well known within the evangelical circles. His name is Leith Anderson. For a number of decades, he was pastor of one of the largest churches in Minneapolis called Wooddale. Very, very influential man. Shortly after the movie Sister Act came out, anybody remember that movie? Sister Act? Shortly after that, that film came out, he had a um, he had a short teaching opportunity at Grace Seminary for graduate students. I attended that class. And the reason I recall the movie and it being around that time frame, he used a clip from that movie, you know, uh, a relevant pop culture example of what he was trying to communicate. 
Leith Anderson was an individual who in the early 90s began to write about this new emerging spirituality. He was one of the foremost instigators of what we now call the emergent movement. Doug Padgett, a name most of you recognize, was youth pastor at Wooddale, Wooddale Church. When Bob Buford wanted to bring together a group of, of young youth pastors in order to have an impact on the youth of America, he utilized the counsel of Leif Anderson in identifying those young men. Now, within a short period of time, that movement ceased being a youth movement, and it became a counter-response to the evangelical church in this country. Leif Anderson helped to launch what we call the Emergent Church. Leif Anderson, in March of 2012, endorsed the document which was an update and restatement of evangelicals and Catholics together. He was one of the driving forces of the, Man, um, the Manhattan Declaration. And he was one of the signers of a Christian response, loving God and neighbor together, a Christian response to a common word between you and me. A common word between you and me was a letter written to evangelical pastors in the West by a group of Muslim clerics quoting from the Quran, inviting Christians to dialogue with them on what they share in common. Leif Anderson signed that document. And he signed that document while he was president of the National Association of Evangelicals. Widely respected. Incredibly influential. I do not agree for many of the things that he stands for. One of the reasons why I mention Leith Anderson is because I was a member of that class that he taught. I had graduated from seminary some years before, was a pastor in Cincinnati, traveled up to Winona Lake, Indiana, and sat through that, that week-long class. At one point, he shared to the class his view of the role of women in Christian ministry, which was thoroughly egalitarian. Namely, women can be fully functioning pastors within the church. Bells and whistles went off in my head, and... I went up to him after class and I said, Pastor Anderson, what do you do with 1 Timothy chapter 2? You know, the last six verses or so. And he utterly dismissed it and said, that was a cultural phenomenon in the days, in the days of Paul and it is no longer operational today. It was only for the culture of that day. I invite your attention to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2. Verses 9 to 15. Like 
Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold and pearls and costly garments, but rather by means of good works as befits women making a claim to godliness. Let a woman quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. He said that was culturally conditioned. No longer applicable at that time in the 20th century, now in the 21st century. Unfortunately, he didn't allow the next two verses to set the context for his view. For it was Adam who was first created. Is that culturally conditioned? Yes or no? No. And then Eve. So the order of creation is one of the bases for women not being elders and pastors in local churches in the body of Christ. And then verse 14. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being quite deceived fell into transgression. Was the order of the fall, is that culturally conditioned? No. No. It's going to be the same whether you're talking about the 1st century or the 21st century. It is transcultural. That passage will be in effect until the end of the church age. Now, why do I... Why do I even mention this? It's because of the terminology used. Verse 14. Adam was deceived. Apatao. Apatao. Adam was deceived. But Eve was completely deceived or utterly deceived. Ex apatao. There's a Greek prefix on the verb intensifying. Eve was thoroughly and utterly deceived. Adam, he knew what was going on. He chose to sin with his eyes wide open. He chose to follow the lead of his wife. But his wife was deceived by the serpent. The only other time that I'm aware of where Paul mentions the deception of Eve by the serpent 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Anybody want to take a a guess what verb is used in that passage? Ex apata. Utterly deceived. There's something about spiritual deception when women exercise authority with the word over men. They are susceptible to deception on a level that, quite frankly, I don't understand and I can't explain. But that doesn't change the fact that God's word is clear on this issue and on this matter. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Now, this leads us to the fourth use of the word planao in Matthew 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Verse 4, we have the command. See to it that no one misleads you. Verse 5, a warning. Many false Christs will arise. Verse 11, a warning. Many false prophets will arise. Verse 24, it combines those two in one verse. False Christ and false prophets will arise. Now, who is ultimately behind this deception? Well, it's Satan. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12.
in a context which I personally believe takes place in the middle of the 70th seven of Daniel, when Satan is cast out of heaven and is thrown down to the earth for a period of three and a half years, we read these words in verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Satan is the serpent. He is the deceiver. Look at chapter 13, speaking of the false prophet in relation to the beast who we customarily identify as the Antichrist. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. The false prophet is going to deceive all unbelievers on this planet about the identity of the beast. Turn over to chapter 16. Beginning with verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river, the Euphrates. Its water was dried up, that the way might be prepared for the kings from the east. I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeps his garment, lest he walk about naked and men see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which is called uh, in Hebrew, Har, or Mount Megiddo, Armageddon, Armageddon. They're going to deceive the world to gather together in the plain of Jezreel at the base of Mount Megiddo in order to make war against God. That's how persuasive they will be. Chapter 19 and verse 20. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived, there's that word plumao again, those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. Now notice the first ten verses of chapter 20. By the way, all of these references uh, that I've read to you, with the exception of chapter 16, verses 12 to 16. All of these passages contain the word planao. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the abyss, shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until a thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Now, look down to verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. What does the book of Revelation tell us? That Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet will deceive all unbelievers on planet Earth. Satan is the father of lies. Satan is the father of deception. When Jesus warns about Satan, he's warning us about spiritual warfare and the forces of spiritual darkness. Now, what can we do?
in light of Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. By the way, um, on the 20th of April, we'll be starting a new series on the 20th of April on the Sermon on the Mount. This passage is from that sermon. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Satan will use false signs and wonders in the name of Christ to mislead people into believing that they're Christians. But they're not Christians. They never knew Christ. They only practiced lawlessness, which means that they never repented of their sin, and they never believed in the gospel. There is an ever-increasing emphasis on signs and wonders and miracles within the body of Christ today. You need to be careful. In conclusion, here's our response. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. I'll let you read that at some point later today, maybe this week. It's a verse that takes persecution and the concept of deception and instructs us to rely upon the Word of God which is sufficient to do what God has designed it to do. Remember, Jesus Christ is the truth. I am the way and the truth and the life. John 14, 6. The night before he was crucified, he shared that with his disciples. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Three times on that night, he shared with his disciples that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. John 14, 17, 15, 26, 16, 13. That same night, Jesus said, God's word is the truth. Sanctify them in thy word. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. These three things are being declared to be insufficient by the father of lies. I'm here to tell you today, Jesus Christ is sufficient. The gospel of Jesus Christ is sufficient to save. The spirit of, of, of truth is sufficient. The spirit of truth is sufficient to sanctify us into holy Christian living. The word of God is sufficient to communicate to us the character and the will of God for our lives until his son returns. See to it that no one misleads you. Our enemy, <coughs> very deceptive, very seductive. He knows, he knows our areas of weakness. He knows what we're attracted to. He knows how to disguise that hook so that we wouldn't even know it's a hook. Be careful. Rely upon the resources that God has given us. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Abide in Christ, as, as Steve shared with us last week. Embrace the ministry of the Spirit of God in your life and rely upon His Word. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I pray You'll take this message and challenge our hearts. Father, thank You for this church and its stand for the truth. May we as individuals continue to walk in the truth until Jesus comes. We pray it in his name. Amen.